I invite you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles as we begin today to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 2, a passage that we read partially in your hearing a few moments ago, the passage that has occupied our attention for several weeks now, Luke chapter 2. I would imagine that throughout most of the history that when people have a child, when people have a baby, when there's a new baby in the house, that there's all kinds of expectations and hopes. There's all kinds of uh, uh, people who have great things in store for their baby and grandmas and grandpas gather around the baby and they say, oh, look at it, and they pinch the cheeks. They do that. They pinch the cheeks and they say, oh, what a great little baby this is. Isn't he cute? Isn't she cute? The baby looks just like her father or her mother or whatever. It looks like one of them anyway. Man, there's always such adoration and exaltation and hope and excitement for a child when they're born. Dad goes, well, he's going to be my football player, you know. She's going to be my princess. All of these things. But in this passage, as we have read, how would you like to have been Mary and Joseph coming into the temple, holding their baby son, Jesus, barely six weeks old, and gathering around him is one of the leading, most likely one of the leading Pharisees in all of Israel, one of the most famous men, perhaps. And another woman comes up and starts praising God. And, and this man, Simeon, is telling you all of the things that are going to happen to your child, all of these things that are going to come about that you didn't know or weren't, weren't expecting or didn't know would happen. And look at verse 33. His mother, his father, and mother were amazed at these things which were being said about their son. I mean, we read through these things, we study these things, we've gone into these things, but here's Mary and Joseph. It's their child, it's their baby. They were amazed at the things that they were hearing. Well, we've been going through this passage, and I want to bring it to a close, at least this section in our study, in our series, The Life of Christ as we see two more elements that Simeon brings to Mary and Joseph regarding their baby, the Son of God, Jesus, whom they were holding in their arms. All of this comes from our first major heading, from the manger to the missing, and as the heading implies, this is not going to be the end of our study of the early days of Jesus Christ. Following this and following our, uh, re our look in the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the next couple of weeks, we're going to return to this and see some other areas of the early days of Christ, including the fact that he went out to Egypt. The wise men came, and those things we're going to pick up with, all dealing with from the manger to the missing. But here we have been seeing the birth of the divine Son of God from chapter 2 in the Gospel of Luke. And we're currently looking at his first visit to the temple. And here, as we read, beginning in verse 25 and following, we spent several weeks looking at the acknowledgement that Simeon brings to the family regarding our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw who he was and what he is like from verse 25, righteous man, a devout man. We saw also from the text the words that he brought to the Holy Family. And this is where we find ourselves currently studying. As he says in verse 30, my eyes have seen your salvation. Speaking of the child, he calls him the salvation of God. We spent one of our messages looking at how important it is to know Christ as Savior. 
We went on from there to consider that he is the Messiah, as the Messiah, the light of revelation to the Gentiles in verse 32. And we spent some time looking at that. In fact, we spent almost two weeks looking at the fact that he would be a light to the world. Not just a savior for the Jews, but a savior for the world. And again, it should not have been surprising to the Jews, and yet they, they would not have wanted to hear this. They hated to hear about anyone speaking to Gentiles about the Christ or thinking of Gentiles coming to salvation in Christ. That was unthinkable. They thought that the Messiah was for themselves, yet they shouldn't have because all he is doing is quoting Isaiah chapter 9 and 42 and 49, and we looked at these, where Israel was always said to be a light to the Gentiles, always supposed to tell others about the God of the Bible, of the Bible our Lord. In fact, Jesus himself quotes Isaiah chapter 9 regarding the people in darkness who will now see a great light. And we, we even mention that great famous verse, John 3.16. For God so loved not just the Jews, but the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. This is the message of the New Testament. That salvation goes out to all men, to all races. That people from every tribe and every nation and every country are saved by the grace of God. This is indeed who our Savior is. The Savior of the world. And then we saw that he says here in this text, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And that's where we left off last Lord's Day, saying that Jesus is the glory of the nation of Israel. And you think about it, he is the fulfillment of all of the promises that God had made in the Old Testament. And that God called the nation of Israel, set them apart, set them apart from the rest of the world, called them to himself to follow him, that from the nation of Israel would come this Messiah. The unprecedented honor that God bestowed upon Israel, that the Messiah would come from them. That is the glory of the nation of Israel. He is the glory of the nation of Israel, the culmination of the redemptive work of God, the glory, the crown, the king. This is our Savior. In that sense, then, he is the glory of the nation of Israel, all that God promised. But yet we saw, and I'm going to ask you to turn there again very briefly. We have some who were not here last week. If you would, please turn back to the Gospel of John and chapter 1. John chapter 1. Here is the one who should be adored, received, a, the, the one who should be worshipped and acclaimed by all of Israel. And yet, here's what we read, verse 11 of John chapter 1. You know, I'm going to back up and pick up some familiar verses. Verse 9. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. A light to the Gentiles. That's what we read in Luke 2. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. And so he came to his own, the Jews, but those who were his own did not receive him. They rejected him. They did not embrace him. 
So where then is he the glory? He is the glory as he is fulfilled in the following verses, as he said in our text right here, following verse 11, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The world, word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Those who are saved by his grace are the ones who see him as glorious. And so we are the fulfillment of the glory of Israel. Those who know him as Savior, who have been saved by his grace and drawn to him. Not those who rejected him. They were not seeing him as the glory. But those of us who have been saved by his grace know him to be glorious and wonderful in our Savior. Okay, we know that there are so many people today who do not see the glory of Christ in their lives. We know that they don't see the glory of God, even in so many churches where men seek to gain glory to himself. But let us be those who see Christ as glorious. Back to our text. As we move on to another area that Simeon focuses on or mentions in our text. As he says next, picking up in verse 34, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel. So t today we're going to look first at the fall and rise of many. Now I said to you, when we started looking at some of these things that Simeon said to the Mary and Joseph and about the baby Jesus, that some of them were actually quite profound quite substantial, as he says he's the Savior, as he says that he is the one who would be the light to a revelation to the Gentiles. These things are profound. These things are substantial. But so is this. Now put yourself in the place of the average Jew living in the day of Jesus. And you are one who might even be someone who is thinking about the things of God, thinking about the Messiah, and, and you might be one wondering and waiting for the, <clears throat> excuse me, for the Messiah to come. You would want to be looking for the Messiah because you expected the Messiah to be your deliverer. The Messiah was going to come and deliver the nation of Israel, free them from every oppressor. Free them from the bondage of Rome. Free them from anyone who would oppress them. That's what they were thinking. They were looking for the Messiah to come and restore them to the glory of Israel that was there when Solomon was king. Let's set up Israel again and make it great again. Let's make Israel great again. So they were waiting for the Messiah to come and free them from the bondages of Rome and other things. All the Messiah was to be, was to be good. That's the, what they were thinking. The Messiah, he's the one. He's the one we're waiting for. When he comes, he's going to make everything right. He's going to make everything good. He's going to make it great. He's the one. All they thought that the Messiah would be, would be good for the nation of Israel. But what does Simeon say? blessed Mary and his mother and said, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall of many in Israel. For the fall and the rising. For the fall and the rise of many. First of all, though, he says fall. What? Wait a minute. You mean he's not going to be good for everyone? There's going to be some kind of a fall thing for Israel? 
That's not what we were told. That's not what we, what we expected. We, th we thought the Messiah was going to come and make everything right for all of us. The Messiah was for us, the Jews. How could you say there might be some kind of a fall involved with Israel, with the Messiah coming? No, 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 no. The Messiah is going to make everything right. This is what they thought. The Messiah would come and set up and establish and reestablish the great kingdom. And the Messiah would be great. The Messiah would be good. But he says the fall of many. That's not supposed to be. That's not supposed to happen. But you know, Jesus taught this. 30 years after this, let's listen to what Jesus says about this very aspect. Turn in your Bibles back to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. We're going to take a little bit of time today to open up what is commonly called to the parable of the landowner, sometimes referred to as the uh, parable of the tenants. Matthew, chapter 21. So follow with me as we begin here in Matthew 21 at verse 33. Jesus says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower. It's a pretty elaborate setup. The landowner did all the work, established everything that was there. In other words, the landowner did the work, created it, made it, had it all ready, planted a vineyard, put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, built a tower, all of these things. A nice place. A good place. And what did he do? Rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. So he rented it out to others. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. And the vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. And again, he sent another group of slaves, larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. A couple of things we have to see here right away. Number one, the people that were in the vineyard didn't own it. They rented it. It was rented to them by the grace of the owner. By the grace of the one who built the vineyard. He builds the vineyard, does all of these things for the vineyard, and says to these vine growers, okay, you can rent it out, but here's the rent. When the harvest comes, I expect my portion, and I'll let you have some. He does this to them, and when he sends those to collect the rent, they mistreat them. The vine growers took the slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. They did the same thing to the next group. Now, who is this? What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking about the Jewish people who he called and he gave his law and he gave the land. He owned it. He was God. He was head. He was Lord. He had it all. And he loaned it to the people of Israel. He loaned it to the nation. And he would send his prophets to them to tell them that they needed to be those who were living in accordance with his word. They were supposed to be alike to the Gentiles. They were supposed to follow God. But they followed pagan gods. They turned to false gods and false teachings. And they did all kinds of unimaginable things right in the temple when you read through Isaiah and Ezekiel, and Jeremiah, 
You read through his prophets and you see the wicked things that the nation was doing. But he kept sending his prophets to them to tell them to turn back. But they would not listen. And they killed them. And they did not heed them. Even though God was the owner, Israel was the renter, they did not give their due. So what happens? He sends out these men to the vineyard who were continually mistreated and ignored. They continually mistreated the servants. God calling Israel, God sending his prophets. Now, if you will, look down to verse 37. But afterward, he sent his son. He sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. Who's that? Well, that, of course, is Jesus, the Messiah. God sends his son, his only begotten son, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And they took him <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. This is what they did to the son. They killed the prophets. They did not heed the prophets. God sends his son and they kill him. So Jesus asks in verse 40, Excuse me. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And you gotta, Jesus was so powerful, so wonderful. He gives them this beautiful picture of this great vineyard, this beautiful vineyard. Got the wall, got the tower. It's a great place. These people rent it. And they're ungrateful. They're unworthy. So Jesus asks them themselves, what will the, the owner of the name you do? And these guys are chomping at the bit. And look at this. They answer correctly. Well, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. And he will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the pop proper season. That's only the right thing to do. It'll be taken away from the original renters and given to those who will bring fruit to the owner in the proper season. That's the right answer. And so Jesus' response in verse 42, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. Remember what Simeon said. The fall and rise of many. This kingdom will be taken away from you and given to a people producing the fruit of it. The fall and rise of many. The kingdom will be taken away from them and given to those who will bear fruit. And then he says this, and I want you to keep this in mind as we will refer to it. And he who falls on this stone, that is the stone which the builders rejected, the chief cornerstone from the Lord, 
the stone which the builders rejected, when he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but whomever, on whomever it falls, it will scatter them like dust, or they will be crushed. And what is he talking about there? Of course, Jesus is the chief corner stone. And when men fall upon him, fall before him, they are broken. We'll talk more about that. But on those on whom that stone falls, they will be crushed. Many of the Jews fell upon that stone, which was Jesus. Many of the early believers Many of those who were saved by the grace of God, <clears throat> excuse me, in the preaching of Peter, and even the preaching of Paul, though Paul went on to the Gentiles, but many of those who were first saved by the grace of God were the Jews. The rise of many, many of them. But unfortunately, so many more were those upon whom the stone fell and were crushed. Many more rejected him, and they would be crushed, ultimately meaning that they would be condemned to hell. And as we know from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, this is what came to pass. There were many who were raised up, many who were saved, Many who became the children of God, following the Messiah, Jesus Christ. They were raised up. But there were so many who opposed the preaching and the teaching that Jesus was the Messiah. So many of them had this rock crush them as it fell upon them. So here we have the landowner, the owner of the vineyard, renting it out to those who mistreated God, mistreated his word, mistreated the prophets, ignored him, turned to other things. Do you realize that the people of Israel in the Old Testament were sacrificing their children to the god Molech? They rejected God, and they rejected his ways. And he takes the kingdom from them. We have in our day a similar situation. Mark my words, America is not a Christian nation and actually never was. However, it was predominantly established by men using biblical principles. And it was predominantly inhabited by men who loved God, praised God. Do you know that some of the early presidents actually preached in the Capitol building? I mean, America was a land blessed by God from sea to shining sea. But what has happened? What has happened in America is that we have rebelled. So many have rebelled against the owner of the land. So many have rebelled against the God who has blessed us with all that we have. Blessed us that as everything that we are. He has given it to us. Cared for us. And now, those who come with the word of God, rejected, kicked out, ignored. God kicked out, ignored in so many ways. Oh, we need a time in America again when men would fall on the rock and be broken, humbled, brought to their knees, brought to repentance, cry out to God for mercy. We need it again so badly. All right, back to our text in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 2. 
He says that this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many. Simeon was declaring what would come to pass with the nation of Israel and the raising up of the Gentiles. So, the coming of the Messiah for so many of the nation of Israel was not at all what they expected. They expected the Messiah to come and redeem them, give them everything, set them back up as rich and out from under the tyranny of Rome or anyone else. They expected everything that would happen with the Messiah would be good for the nation of Israel. But it's not. It incurred the judgment of the nation of Israel for a great part of the nation of Israel. It actually brought judgment to the nation. And as I said, even about all of the land, I fear we find the same thing in churches today. There are so many people that are looking forward to the return of Christ, looking forward, in some cases, to a rapture, looking forward to these things. And they're thinking it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be good for us. Because we go to church. But it's not. I fear that it will be judgment to many people who belong to religious places, religious organizations. Oh, they're so religious. Their leaders walk around in robes. Fancy robes and neat collars and pointy hats. Oh, when God comes and when Jesus comes again, it's going to be so great. It's going to be so wonderful. It's going to be judgment. They're expecting the return of Christ to be a good thing. And it will result in their judgment. Places with their traditions and rituals and prayer books and liturgies. The return of Christ will not be good for them. Places that focus on worldly experiences, amusements, fun, entertainment, jokes and stories. All these people who attend these places, these mega churches, they all think, oh, come Lord Jesus, come. Rapture us away. Take us up. It'll be great. It'll be wonderful. It'll be judgment. Because they don't know God. They're playing games. These places, these places that call themselves churches and focus on worldliness, health and wealth, these places that do not preach the word of God and practice decisional regeneration. Oh, just raise your hand and come down the aisle. Get dumped in the tank. Places are filled with people that are lost and going to hell. But thinking they're going to go to heaven. And if Christ were to return, they'd go with him. Just like the Jews. When the Messiah comes, it'll be great. When Jesus returns, it'll be great. It'll be judgment. Judgment on so many. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. It's easy to be on it. You know, forget the pagans. They don't even care about the road. Broad road, narrow road, they don't care. But there's so many people who think they're Christians that are on the broad road. Oh, the return of Christ will be wonderful. No. It's the fall of many. They think his coming or a rapture will be a good thing. But once again, I want to turn to our Lord's words and see what he says. For this, turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew again 
and this time chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Let's pick this up beginning in verse 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Now listen to what he says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Do you hear that? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but is the one who does the will of my Father. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. Who are they? Religious people. We were prophesying in your name. And in your name performing miracles. These were religious people. But they were people in whom there was no evidence of salvation. <clears throat> just, excuse me, people who were just saying, Lord, Lord. In other words, they were Christians in name only. They might go to church on a Sunday, or in many cases a Saturday night, or a Thursday night, or whatever. But then the rest of the week, they're back out in the world. They go to a priest and confess, and then just do as they want for the rest of the week. They genuflect, they stand, they sing, they do whatever they're told. Blind guides leading the blind and they will both or all fall into a pit. They're religious. They say, Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Did we not change our law? Did we not see uh, preaching many sermons? Did we not come in your name and perform mighty miracles? Can you imagine what they would think about the second coming of Christ? Boy, when he comes, it's going to be all good for us. Look at all the stuff we're doing. But in reality... In verse 23, And I will declare to you, to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. So when they stand before the judge, when they stand before Jesus, they will be cast into eternity of hell. Because the criteria is not, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? The criteria is not what miracles you do, what works you perform, how much you go to church. Do you know him? Is he your savior? Are you a son of God? And so what will happen at the coming of the Messiah? Not a great thing. Their judgment. Just like that religious rich man in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 16 
and Lazarus, and they die, and they go into the afterlife, and Lazarus is there in the bosom of Abraham in heaven, but the rich man who was a likely a Pharisee that Jesus was speaking of, the rich man, the religious man, opens his eyes in agony in hell. What am I doing here? Oh, God, have mercy on me. Too late. It's too late. The only criteria for going to glory with Jesus Christ is not your religious works, your wealth, your acts. Do you know me? Depart from me, I never knew you. People, Jesus is telling us in these passages that following God is not rituals. It's not putting in your chime at a church building. And it's not fun and games like so many places today seem to make it out to. Just being Jewish did not save the Jews. And just going to church will not save anybody. You must be born again. You must become like he's speaking of in this passage who bear fruit for the kingdom of God. You will know them by their fruit. When you're saved, it's not turning over a new leaf. It's not just trying to be good. You become a new creature in Christ because you know him and you have been saved by his grace. Who are they? Who are those people? They are those who fall upon the rock. That is the chief cornerstone. Those who fall upon the rock of Jesus and humble themselves and repent and are saved by his grace. Those will stand before God and he will say, Welcome into my kingdom. Do you know him? Have you fallen on that rock, the chief cornerstone, and been broken by him, humbled by him, and saved by him? Has that rock been your salvation, or will it crush you? The fall and rise of many. Back to our text in Luke chapter 2. This is what Simeon is talking about. The fall and rise of many. And it's true today. All right, so here in this passage, we have seen him speak of Jesus as Savior, the salvation or our Savior, the Savior. We have seen him speak of him as the light to all nations. We have seen him speak of him and call him the glory of Israel. And here he speaks of him as the rise and fall of many. And I want to close with one more point from this passage as we see him say that he is the revelation of hearts. At the end of verse 34, the text says, And for a sign to be opposed... And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. The thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. What is he talking about? Well, picking up with what he says at the end of verse 34, and for a sign to be opposed, he is once again addressing the fact that even though the Messiah was God's own son, that the Messiah was God's love to the people of Israel, that he gave to the people of Israel, he was opposed. He was opposed by them. A sign to be opposed. And then following that, he says in the beginning of verse 34 and 35, that a sword will pierce even your own soul. Now, what's he talking about here? Remember, 
Simeon is addressing Mary and Joseph and probably particularly Mary and we speak of this he speaks of this sword and what he's speaking of is what it would be called a sword of reproach a sword of sorrow a sword of reproach that would come to their lives and now think with me about Mary and Joseph those to whom he's speaking and the sorrow and the pain that they endured as they were the parents of baby Jesus, beginning with what we could call the scandal of conception, though unmarried. Remember, to many, Mary remained an outcast because she had a baby out of wedlock. Even Joseph considered putting away, putting her away privately. She could have been stoned. Killed because she had a baby out of wedlock. And that never went away. That never went away all her life. This baby was an illegitimate child because she was pregnant prior to their marriage, the consummation of their marriage. And so they could have seen this as shame and sorrow, a scandal. Think of the terror that gripped their hearts when they were in Bethlehem and Herod sent the soldiers to go and kill every child under the age of two in Bethlehem. All of those children murdered by Herod because he wanted to kill their son. And you could think that you were the cause of this. And the terror, <clears throat> excuse me, that would have been brought on them from Herod, the king, killing all the babies because they wanted to kill your son. And then the fear as he grew in life and was constantly opposed by the church or the synagogue the Pharisees, the scribes, constantly opposed. Constant conflict. And what fear that would have brought to Mary's heart, witnessing her son constantly doing battle, as it were, with the religious leaders of the day. Constantly condemning him, deriding him, mocking him chastising him. What does that do to a mother's heart? A sword will pierce your heart. And then can you imagine the pain? As your son is falsely arrested, put on a mock trial, scourged, having his flesh ripped apart, punched, beaten, crown of thorns on his head, all of the wickedness that was done to him. Can you imagine seeing your son hanging on a cross, bleeding, naked, shame? Mary saw that. She was right at the foot of the cross. Can you imagine the pain that she saw that she felt seeing her son in that place? Because people, no matter what else, it was her 33-year-old son. Seeing him there in agony, dying on the cross, a sword pierced her heart. This is the sword, Simeon says, that is awaiting her, awaiting them, awaiting their life. And then that shows, as he says in this, that the thoughts 
of many hearts may be revealed. What's he talking about? Everything that we've been saying all along. You look through the New Testament, you look through the Scriptures, you look through the, the Gospels, and you see the hearts of the scribes and the Pharisees as so wicked. Their hearts are revealed for the wickedness that they have become. A sign to oppose your son. The sword piercing your soul from all they did for, in their opinion and in their eyes, the glory of God was against God. Revealing their hearts as evil. Revealing their hearts as unholy. All of these supposedly religious people who seem to be so holy in front of the masses, their hearts are revealed as wicked. Isn't that the same thing we see in our own land? Oh, the president, oh, the congressman, oh, the senator, so wonderful, wicked! Their hearts will reveal for all the world to see that they opposed the Messiah. All these religious people, all the scribes, the Pharisees, the Jew, the hypocrisy of their hearts was exposed. And that's what was to come upon this couple and their child. And I say to you, this is rampant in the church today. Men's hearts will be revealed for their hypocrisy as they just go to churches and think they're okay. But one day, you will know for sure the hypocrisy as their hearts are unveiled or revealed. These men who pretend to be holy in churches today. Thinking that the return of the Messiah will be a good thing. Their hearts will be revealed. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do miracles? Did we not cast demons? I never knew you. Depart. Their hearts will be Revealed. What will you say on that day? What will be said to you on that day? Will you hear Jesus say, Depart! I never knew you! Or will he draw you to himself and come to the glory prepared by my Father? Good and faithful servant. And who would that be? The one who fell upon the rock. The one who was humbled and repented and fell upon the rock. And then as Anna says in the end of our text, she was a prophetess that was there and she began to praise God and giving thanks and continued to speak of him to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. That's the same language that was used to describe Simeon in verse 25. A man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, who was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. What does that mean? He was saved. He's going to be the glory of those who will be saved by his grace. So all of these things that are said about Jesus in so many ways were great and wonderful, and yet so many ways were negative against those who would oppose him. Which camp are you in? There's only two kingdoms the kingdom of Satan and those who follow him whose hearts will be revealed or the kingdom of King Jesus and those who follow him 
Which camp are you in? Which kingdom are you in? Is this true of you? That you are a man who is righteous and devout and looking for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit is upon you? Or are you a one? Or are you one who is a sign to oppose the Messiah? This is what Simeon lays out. This is their first visit to the temple. Of course, Jesus in the Gospels has many more visits to the temple. And as I said, in the weeks to come, we'll look at other aspects of our Lord's early life and then all through his life. But for today, make sure that you get along with God and that you know that you have fallen on the rock and have been broken by it and are a true follower of Jesus. Lest you hear, depart! I never knew you. Oh, I don't want that to happen to any of you here. God have mercy on your souls. Let's pray. Father, as we bow before you, we acknowledge you to be the God with whom men have to do. And I pray that you would deal with the people in this congregation today who have never known you, who have never been saved by your grace. Make hell real to them that they would flee from it and flee to you and be saved by your grace. Oh God, hear our prayers for them today as we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen.